Hey, hi everyone. My name is Donna Lyons. I'm with the School of Law Trinity College Dublin and you're very welcome to today's discussion with Professor Philip Austin. This is seminar 11 in our speaker series. Philip G. Austin is John Norton Pomeroy Professor of Law at New York University School of Law. He co-chairs the NYU Center for Human Rights and Global Justice and teaches international law, human rights law, economic and social rights and strategic human rights litigation. Um, he actually lectured me in NYU in international human rights law in 2009, and that was a very rich and rewarding academic experience. So it's really nice to be reconnecting now. Um, as both a scholar and practitioner, his current work focuses on the human rights dimensions of issues such as neoliberal economic policies, climate change, artificial intelligence, and poverty elimination. Philip previously taught at the European University Institute, the Australian National University, Harvard Law School, and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Between 2014 and July of this year, he was UN Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. And from 2004 to 2010, he was UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Executions, monitoring unlawful killings around the world. And he's also held numerous other high level positions within the UN. In addition to that, he's a prolific writer uh, and has published this edited collection with Nikki Reich uh, in 2019. That's an Oxford University Press publication. So in this book, Experts in Human Rights Law and in Tax Law debate the linkages between the two fields and highlight how each can help to tackle rapidly growing inequality um, in the economic, social and political realms. And we'll have a chance to talk more um, about the ins and outs of that. So just to say, uh, Professor Alston, you're a highly respected amongst um, academic students and alumni of Trinity College, and I use your material, both scholarly and your special rapporteur reports, um, every time I teach international human rights law, and I, I often show the press um, conference videos to the students, so they're, they're hugely um, influenced um, and I'm big fans of yours. So to say I admire your, your work would be a, an understatement, and it's a great privilege to speak with you today. So I wanted to ask a little bit first about fiscal consolidation. So in the introduction to the edited collection, you talk about this concept of fiscal sustainability or fiscal consolidation. So the first sentence being that a key issue that underpins some of the phenomena examined in this book is the policy of fiscal consolidation, strongly promoted by most international economic institutions and prized by financial markets. Um, could you explain how fiscal consol consolidation as a policy has emerged to what it means in practice and what the problems with this economic policy are in your opinion? Uh, well, thanks uh, for, for, uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to talk. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, it's a great series that you're doing. Um, the strange answer to your question is that the term fiscal consolidation um, is, how should I describe it? Um, it's essentially misleading packaging, but it has been very successful packaging. Um, what is really being talked about is what is commonly called austerity. Um, it, it, uh, fiscal uh, consolidation is a term that is used to promote and justify the essentials of neoliberal economic policies. Uh, and those neoliberal economic policies involve um, reducing tax levels uh, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, reducing the size and role of government, uh, deregulating the economy, uh, opening the economy up to as much possible competition as possible, and privatizing as many previously, uh, many functions previously performed by or overseen by governments. And so what happens is that uh, when governments are uh, strongly encouraged or even compelled if they are subject to stiff loan requirements uh, to cut tax levels, for example, 
um, they then find themselves with no option uh, but to uh, reduce their spending um, in order to make the uh, books balance. Uh, reduced spending in turn leads to um, lower capacity to provide any forms of social protection for the population. But since things are being privatized uh, anyway, that's not a problem. And fiscal consolidation is then sold, particularly by the International Monetary Fund, uh, but also by the World Bank and other international agencies uh, as a, a crucial way of uh, achieving economic balance within the society uh, and attracting foreign direct investment. Uh, what we know, however, is that in a great many countries, uh, it hasn't produced uh, significant economic benefits, and certainly not benefits for the people of the country itself. Uh, what neoliberalism does is to uh, increase levels of inequality. Um, the ideal response would be that the additional resources generated would of course flow down uh, the economic ladder, but that also doesn't happen. And that's why we've seen record levels of inequality being accumulated uh, in so many countries around the world. And this is something that has gone hand in hand with so-called fiscal consolidation. Thank you for that. Um, and I suppose that ties in to the explanation you give of the emergence and history of the concept of fiscal consolidation. So in the book, you speak about um, the development and decline of the welfare state following World War II, and that was followed by the debt state and then policies of austerity, as you just mentioned, and then finally fiscal sustainability. So if the latter is undesirable, would it, you be of the opinion that we should aim for a reversion to the welfare state or what, what's your opinion in terms of a, what a, bet, a better model would be at this point for reducing economic inequality? Uh, I guess, first of all, in terms of uh, phases of economic policy, um, we should all uh, acknowledge that we are about to head into a whole new era of austerity. Um, the various international agencies that are encouraging governments to spend and to borrow uh, in order to cushion the impact of COVID-19 are also signaling at the same time that there will be a time of reckoning. So there hasn't been the sort of debt forgiveness uh, that has been urged and which would make it feasible for the more indebted developing countries to both pursue uh, expansionary COVID-19 policies while at the same time not needing to pursue, to follow that up with uh, austerity packages. Uh, so we're going to see um, starting early next year, no doubt, uh, a greatly renewed push um, for austerity <clears throat> and thus for the further reduction of uh, government support for the less well off, for the disadvantaged uh, and um, just fewer uh, opportunities for any sort of social safety net to work effectively in many of the countries concerned. Um, I think it's important to note that what we should be talking about when we look at economic policy and this from this, uh, uh, this great overview as it were, uh, is that there isn't a single way for an economy to grow. Um, the model that is being pushed now depends on businesses being given largely a free hand with very low levels of taxation, 
very little regulation, the opportunity to really do whatever they want. Now, in principle, that should lead to great innovation. It should lead to uh, a real uh, stimulation of the economy. But in reality, there are limits simply um, liberating, enabling um, either foreign or local investors to do whatever they want and pay very few taxes doesn't bring any guarantee at all of economic health for the society as a whole. And so what is needed is a balanced approach where uh, business is able to operate uh, effectively, has the incentives that it needs, but also operates against a background of meaningful governmental regulation. There's always regulation uh, in any economy, but that regulation can be used entirely in the interests of corporate well-being or can be adjusted so that it seeks a balance between uh, citizen well-being and that of the overall economy. Uh, so we're not talking about, do you want a welfare state or do you want an effective thriving economy? Uh, clearly what's needed is a thriving economy, but one that is for all of the people, one that has elements of redistribution uh, that ensures that the profits that are generated are then distributed equitably. Um, and one in which uh, those who are the least well off and the whole principle of capitalism essentially is that there are going to be many losers who won't be able to keep up. Uh, who won't be able to compensate for the unexpected illnesses or injuries or family problems. And it is the appropriate role for the state to be able to assist those individuals to get back on their feet. Uh, we don't need to call it a welfare state, but we do need to talk about conceptions of social protection, which should be seen as a right for all citizens. Uh, the fact that so many countries will say, oh, yes, but we couldn't possibly afford that is for the most part disingenuous. Uh, in fact, they've opted not to afford it because they would rather enrich the elites, which of course dominate the governments in these countries, uh, than trying to ensure some sort of reasonable distribution of resources through uh, progressive taxation. Yes, so speaking about enriching the elites um, and maybe tax cuts for corporations as being part of that flawed policy, um, what would you feel are the advantages of human rights terminology and the human rights ideology for an analysis and reform of tax systems? Well, I think we have to, I mean, the the starting point for tax policy, first of all, from the tax point of view, is what are your objectives? And so if you define those objectives purely in terms of traditional economic growth, uh, traditional meaning essentially fossil fuel driven growth, um, then you are in an era of uh, an existential threat from climate change, uh, you are setting an objective which might look appealing in uh, sort of traditional economic terms, growth of uh, GDP, uh, etc., et but is not actually going to enhance the well being or in my terminology, the human rights of the average citizen. Uh, the average citizen should have the right to a healthy environment, should have the right to health um, and various other social rights, as well, of course, as all of the civil and political rights. If you start from that point, then the tax system 
is going to have to be designed in such a way as to promote those objectives. If you say, no, 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 sorry, my friend, um, if you want to talk about human rights, you go to the Human Rights Commission, they do that up there. This is the Treasury Department or the Finance Ministry, and we don't do human rights. Once you bifurcate things in that way or divide them up, um, then you are excluding any form of detailed social objectives from motivating the shape of tax policy. And the reality is that every aspect of tax policy has a major impact on rights. Uh, that can be more or less direct. One of the examples that is increasingly being contested around the world, but it's such a sort of banal example that it's worth mentioning, is the so-called tampon tax. Uh, the fact that in a great many countries, um, you've got all sorts of exemptions for necessary items, but unnecessary items or luxury goods, of course, must be taxed. And it just so happens that one of the luxury goods are tampons. Um, whereas in some countries, uh, condoms, for example, will be considered essential goods uh, and not taxed. But that's just one, as I said, banal example of the ways in which uh, when a government says, okay, we're going to radically reduce the tax levels on corporations, the question is, what are the flow on implications for that? How much money is then going to be available to address child poverty? How much money is going to be available to provide basic social housing? How much money is going to be available to mitigate global warming and to promote meaningful targets at the national level to reduce climate change? So each time that a government says we're going to make these trade-offs, we need to be looking at what the trade-offs are because there's no magic pot. Uh, if uh, corporate tax rates are reduced um, to a very low level, then governments don't have the money to be uh, providing those other services. And the trade-off is we're gonna support corporate interests, we're gonna support growing inequality we're going to support uh, a continuing increase in the number of billionaires, and we're going to continue doing all too little about the well-being of the poorer citizens in our society. Thank you for that, and it's a very relevant issue in Ireland, as you know, um, with the Apple case uh, being taken by the European Commission, and um, that's on appeal at the moment, so it will be interesting to see what the outcome there is. Um, but maybe just moving on slightly from the tax question. Um, you and just let me say with the Apple case, I think, I think it is important to focus on that. Yeah. Um, I very much hope that the case will, uh, the, the tax will be upheld. Uh, I understand that Ireland has adopted the low tax strategy. I understand that it has benefited enormously, but it does that at the expense of other countries, very directly demonstrated. Uh, and the submission made by Christian Aid to the Committee on the Rights of the Child, for example, calling upon it to look at the impact of Irish tax policies, I think is a very important initiative uh, and without sort of throwing blame around or pointing fingers, uh, I would hope that the Irish government will start to recalibrate and adopt policies which are more in tune with a, uh, a good neighbourly um, concept and with one that enhances rather than undermines the enjoyment of human rights in other countries. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for that. Um, but just very curious as well about your um, writings on universal basic income. So in chapter 25 of the book, you have um, a discussion about the, the concept of universal basic income. I was wondering, would you like to talk a little bit about that, the advantages and disadvantages and how it might work? Um, universal basic income is really a, 
um, an approach that is always much more complicated than meets the eye uh, because the bottom line is very appealing. In other words, the idea that everyone will get a basic income, that uh, those who are really least well off and who currently have to scrounge uh, to get a few pennies in order to do whatever, uh, let alone to get themselves in shape for the job market and be able to really go out you know, searching for employment and, and working, um, that's all very appealing. The problem is, again, what are the trade-offs? And what we've seen is that if you have a country that already has a strong safety net, um, then you could really only have a universal basic income at the expense of some aspects of that safety net. And that's why you get some of the neoconservatives in the United States supporting strongly a UBI because they see the opportunity to uh, eliminate Medicaid, uh, to eliminate uh, various other forms of government assistance to poor people, food stamps, uh, what housing subsidies, whatever it might be. But of course, while I would be uh, even better off than I am if I was getting $1,000 a month as a UBI, uh, a person who is on welfare, say the classic single mother with a couple of children, uh, the $1,000 would leave her considerably worse off because she wouldn't get housing subsidies, she wouldn't get education subsidies, she wouldn't get childcare, she wouldn't get uh, health access. And so the UBI in that context then becomes a uh, a, a program that is going to benefit all but the most needy. Um, the IMF, whose prescriptions or analyses I'm generally pretty skeptical of because they're not very flexible and they have one particular model in mind, nonetheless has, I think, uh, come up with an interesting analysis a year or so ago saying that for some countries like India, for example, where the basic safety net is not very good at all, uh, it may be that a universal basic income would be a good way to go. But for a lot of uh, countries that already do have social safety nets that are reasonable, then a UBI, unless it were somehow additional uh, and much more restricted. In other words, only available to a particular uh, group on the income scale, uh, it wouldn't be affordable. The problem is that once you start making those uh, adjustments, the proponents will say, aha, it's no longer you. It's no longer universal. Uh, it, is, it starts to resemble just a, uh, a pension scheme of some sort for poorer people. So all of that is to give you a very unsatisfactory and unhelpful answer. Um, in other words, there are times and places where a UBI would be very valuable, but it's not a uh, going to be a magic bullet in many situations. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just conscious that there are a lot of people with questions there. So I'll just ask one last question and then feel free to bring in anything else you'd like to bring in um, in the Q&A or thereafter. But I am, um, I've always been curious about this um, traditional argument around the distinction or alleged distinction between civil and political rights and economic, social and cultural rights. And that's something that comes up regularly mm. in the book. Um, one of the issues or arguments that often arises there is that allegedly CPR rights are justiciable and economic, social and cultural rights are not. Um, but there is the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that's only been ratified by 24 countries and Ireland hasn't ratified that. Um, I think it's probably something that's very important to promote and I'm wondering if you have any advice uh, for activists and scholars um, willing or wishing to engage with governments uh, in encouraging governments to ratify 
the second optional protocol? Uh, I mean, it, the, the, my response to that would be at several different levels, I think. Um, the most, the least helpful and the most basic answer is that the optional protocol really only provides a last resort uh, possibility for um, re-examination of some small number of issues at the international level. Um, doesn't do anything more really than the European Social Charter already requires states to do. Uh, and so it's as much a gesture of goodwill as it is a genuinely um, demanding accountability process. Uh, it's really not the latter, but it is an opportunity to show that you're committed. The more important answer uh, concerns the relationship between the two sets of rights. And this has always been a very artificial distinction. And I think, uh, I'm sorry to use the word uh, again, but uh, I never did use it until two or three years ago. Now I realize that it's the only way to accurately characterize where we are. Um, Neoliberal policies um, essentially hide very conveniently behind the supposed major differences between the two sets of rights. Uh, in other words, neoliberalism certainly wants civil and political rights because those civil and political rights are in practice going to be exercised primarily and predominantly by the well-off. Uh, I can go out and demonstrate I can take out advertisements, I can make speeches because I'm well off and I have time. Uh, people who are living in poverty and who are looking for their next meal and they're wondering if their kids are going to eat the next day and so on, uh, for them, those civil and political rights um, are not going to help they depend entirely on social rights. In other words, only if the next day's meals for the children, only if shelter for the children is going to be assured, can those people then enjoy their civil and political rights. And so what we have is a system that says, look, um, civil and political rights are really essential, absolutely. Economic and social rights, well, that's just a matter for the government to decide. But you're then upholding so-called fundamental values when it comes to the rights that matter most to the well-off. And the rights that matter most to the least well-off are suddenly matters of unfettered governmental discretion. And it's just not... Um, an accurate reflection of the reality in so many societies, including Ireland, which does not <clears throat> want to have anything to do with economic and social rights as rights. There are nonetheless social policies that are legislated uh, where a right, an effective legal right can be claimed by a beneficiary um, and if those rights reflected a comprehensive range of what we consider to be economic and social rights, you would see very clearly that social rights would be justiciable. But we've simply chosen to say no. Uh, if there's any sort of economic justification for reining things in, we cannot touch civil and political rights, but economic and social rights become entirely uh, discretionary. And I think that is a, uh, it's a phony distinction and it's deeply problematic. One of the arguments that's regularly brought up in relation to the alleged distinction is that one costs money, one set of rights costs money and the other doesn't. I mean, you've tackled that many times. I'm just wondering if you'd like to reiterate your views on, on that distinction, alleged distinction here. Uh, the problem 
problem is that we actually need to become much more sophisticated than simply focusing on that um, that element. First of all, uh, as is well known, it, it's a, a very artificial argument because upholding civil and political rights actually cost quite a lot of money, not just running election systems, uh, not just ensuring that free speech operates in the society, uh, having policing that is not arbitrary, um, providing the basic uh, services that keep democracy running is an expensive business. But we also have to look at the other side of the balance sheet. What I saw in the United Kingdom, for example, when I did a UN special rapporteur visit there, was that the great savings that the uh, government in Westminster made from its um, great slashing of the welfare budget ended up transferring a lot of additional costs over to the police, the hospitals, emergency services, and others, because suddenly people who were getting preventive care and were able to be uh, functioning within the society were at least metaphorically and often literally thrown out on the street and suddenly they become a charge on the public budget because even the most callous government can't say, well, sorry, people just have to die in the street and we'll pick up the bodies. No, we won't pick up the bodies because that would be spending money. Families can do that. Um, in other words, social rights should be seen as an investment. Um, it's one of the big issues here in the United States, the fact that there isn't um, medical insurance, health insurance for everyone means that with uh, 20 million or more people who are without health insurance, those people are at great risk in terms of their well being, in terms of their ability to work, to function. And it's actually a very bad economic investment not to be providing them with basic health care and instead to be picking it up in the emergency room uh, where they go with really chronic illnesses that haven't been treated for years. This would be a good moment to bring in um, Alicia Ilayaman, who is a specialist in economic, social and cultural rights in particular in health. So, um, you know, Alicia, Professor Alston. Um, Alicia is a lecturer and senior fellow at the Petri Flom Center for Health Law, Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. And we spoke about her book, When Misfortune Becomes Injustice, Evolving Human Rights Struggles for Health and Social Equality in Seminar 4 of this series. So if you can hear us and see us, go ahead, Alicia. Thank you. I can. Can you hear me? Um, well, first of all, this uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to uh, be in conversation with Philip about this book. Uh, and his work. I want to actually follow up on that last question um, and response that you gave and bring it to this moment in the pandemic. And I have two questions about that. The first is the pandemic starkly demonstrates what you just said about the lack of health insurance and public financing for health care in the United States, but also in other places, as well as the lack of social protection. And I'm wondering if you had any uh, reflections specifically about insights from lessons across countries during this pandemic related to the book and taxation. Um, of course, you're actually the expert on this, uh, Ali, and should be answering it, but... Um, <laughs> um, I'm keenly interested in your insights. I think the problem, as you know very well, um, I think it's always important to try to um, not put a, uh, an unwarranted positive gloss on things. Uh, I would like to say that governments around the world have learned from the disasters of COVID-19 and that they have, oh my God, this is unacceptable. The poorest in our society are bearing the brunt. Uh, they are the ones who are really suffering the most. And the reason is because the health systems 
and other forms of assistance that we've put in place are totally inadequate. And so we have to learn from that. And we have to make sure it's not going to happen again because it's going to be a real problem for us if that continues. Unfortunately, uh, I suspect that there's an awful lot of business as usual, which is, oh yeah, well, the poor are, uh, you know, hit again. Uh, it's going to come, uh, it's going to come around again with climate change. And again, it's the poor who are going to suffer the brunt of it. Uh, we'll actually be okay. Uh, none of my family's been hit by COVID. Uh, I did have a, a cousin, I'm making this up incidentally, I did have a cousin who got very sick, but um, she got the best of medical uh, care and she's now uh, back out. And most of my relatives have gone to their country homes anyway. Uh, so I think we'll uh, be able to weather this. Uh, and I don't think we should up, uh, cause a great upheaval in our economic systems uh, just for this little pass. So that's the, those are the, you know, the two alternatives. One would love to think that there are rational governments that are at least acting in between those two. But I do think that the latter, albeit a parody, is perhaps a more accurate reflection of what a lot of governments are doing. Uh, you, I mean, you seriously, you would know the answer to this, but are, do you, are you seeing flows of resources? Are you seeing uh, real changes in policies designed to ensure <clears throat> more effective health care for the least well off as a result of COVID? Um. Well, I, I also share your um, uh, allergies to being overly um, Pollyannish, um, but, and I certainly don't think we're seeing the longed for tidal wave of justice that our president-elect has cited, um, and we're very happy he reads Irish poetry. Um, <laughs> but I do, uh, we're very happy that he reads at all. Um, if, if I see the uh, the Irish news video of uh, Biden reading uh, Seamus <laughs> Heaney's poetry again. Right. <laughs> but I, I do think that there is a growing uh, civil society recognition that we need to return to the public. There needs to, there's the, the whole issue of um, financing for COVID diagnostics and therapeutics and vaccines is, uh, is, 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 and publicly funded health systems in general um, is, is very much uh, at the center of a lot of civil society advocacy. I do completely agree with you that the other side is going to close the window of opportunity for making structural changes as quickly as possible to move back to business as usual and deeper austerity cuts. Um, so uh, my second question is really about- um, just, just before your second question, Ali, just to say, I totally agree with you. And of course the responsibility then is ours. Uh, in other words, it's, uh, it's civil society. It's the broader voting public that simply has to wake up and say, listen, this is not on. Uh, and that's clearly going to be essential with someone like Biden, whose instincts will be uh, much more centrist and much less prepared to say, yeah, this is a dramatic turning point um, and we, you know, uh, we're not able to do much. Yes, and in my Partners in Health hat, we're definitely working on that. Um, but it also requires targeting international financial institutions, as you well know, and uh, um, so my second question is actually about the, the global order. And you've talked about tethering development priorities to private philanthropist mm. corporate investment as opposed to the, the public um, uh, commitments and use of taxes to raise money. Um, but uh, that seems especially um, you know, now when there's uh, this combination of neoliberalism and uh, ethno-nationalism uh, 
all of the UN agencies are struggling to get resources. There's a meeting this week about uh, providing more financing to the WHO that Germany is trying to push for. Um, and clearly in the United States, we want the US to rejoin the WHO, but the hollowing out of the global order seems to be a major um, casualty of this neoliberal march toward reduced fiscal space. And you've of course been involved in many UN uh, reform efforts. And I was wondering if you could just speak to that aspect and how you see a path forward for multilateral agencies. The problem is, um, as I see it, that those of us who believe that the private sector cannot, will not, and should not actually be responsible for basic social welfare, as it were, for providing uh, education, for providing health care, uh, for providing even infrastructure. I don't think that the private sector is ever going to do any of those things in the interests of the less well-off members of society, even if they do them well, which of course is always open to debate, uh, for the better off. I think we need to go back to uh, to reverse the ideological assumption, which is now dominant, that the private sector always does things better, it ends up being cheaper, it is more efficient, and it is less corrupt. And the amazing thing is that none of those propositions are borne out by the evidence, which is just extraordinary. And so you have uh, the World Bank um, the policy initiated by Jim Kim before he jumped ship in order to make more money, um, basically saying, we will only fund something if the government can demonstrate that the private sector will not and cannot do it. So there's just a presumption that the private sector is the optimal way forward. And that's just on the evidence in most cases um, a flawed way of thinking about it. We need to start analyzing much more objectively what the best models would be. But until we start really pushing an awareness of how negative the consequences often are of the privatization tsunami, I think it's going to be very difficult to suddenly start turning around international organizations. I think one of the most disappointing things, uh, I understand the position of the World Bank. It's dominated by the United States. Uh, it's allowed itself to be dominated by corporate interests. Uh, the United Nations, on the other hand, is the last organization standing that should be speaking in the broad public interest. And for the current secretary general who, to have gone out on a limb and said, look, if we want to realize the sustainable development goals, it's going to be mainly, primarily, even entirely by the private sector. That is an abdication of the first order. And I think it's a really, poor uh, judgment call on his part. And I think uh, actors in the UN need to start pushing back. But again, that includes us. I think NGOs, civil society, have gone along with a lot of this. They've accepted the line that, of course, there's no option but public-private partnerships. Well, nonsense. Public-private partnerships are not addressing key parts, the most important parts of the SDGs, and they never will. And for NGOs then to fairly tamely say, okay, well, we'll support the Secretary General's approach because that's the only game in town, again, is mistaken. It's not the role that they should be playing. They should be speaking out. 
they should be bringing the evidence to the fore. They should be saying these are the results instead of letting um, private business dominate the debate in its own economic interests and making record profits while uh, services available to the general public uh, diminish. Yeah, I could not agree more. And again, I think the pandemic shows that starkly where there are all of these totally untransparent advanced market commitments for the COVID vaccines. And then the crumbs are left to the COVAX facility for it, 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 which is largely um, the governance of which is ceded in many ways to these corporate interests and to the Gates Foundation. Um, so my last question actually goes to the, what you, your remark on the role of NGOs. And I'm gonna particularly focus on the human rights community and human rights NGOs. Um, uh, and you know the, the the book and your report, your last report to the Human Rights Council, are extremely critical of many institutions, the World Bank and the IMF uh, included. But what do you see as the um, the uh, possible wrong steps or? Um, um, unfruitful strategies that the human rights community, uh, the, the NGO community has been adopting and how could this um, existential crossroads as you've put it, help us to shift course? Um, I mean, first of all, uh, as I think I've said in, as I have said in some of my writings, uh, I'm not only throwing stones at others here. Uh, I acknowledge um, the, uh, the blame on my own part as well. Uh, I think too many of us for too long have said, um, listen, I'm sorry, I'm just a human rights lawyer uh, and I have certain expertise and I can use that to pursue a range of issues. Uh, you tell me you're interested in gender well, as a human rights person, I'm certainly uh, strongly opposed to violence against women. Uh, and I'm you know, running advocacy, advocacy campaigns and doing this and that and the other. So are there any economic dimensions to what you're doing? Well, no, because I'm a human rights defender. Uh, I don't get involved with broader economic policies. But surely the situation that so many women find themselves in, the vulnerability, the lack of alternatives and so on, is linked to their overall economic exclusion from key parts of the economy. And that if we take a longer term look, we're going to have to start addressing what we call, unfortunately, uh, uh, in women's empowerment um, in those domains. Oh yes, no, I understand that, but it's just, that's not what I do because I don't really understand those complex policies. And I think that too many human rights NGOs have not been prepared to do what you've done, Ali, and that is to get down into the details of the relevant issue area. So whether, if it's health, you don't just mess around with some of the sort of legal claims that might be brought. Uh, you instead say, look, we've got to reshape the basic tenets of the system. And yes, I'm a human rights advocate. And yes, that's the job I'm going to do because the human rights framework does actually give me the tools to do a lot more than simply litigate um, or to draw up legislation. But I don't think that enough human rights groups and enough individuals are yet thinking in those terms. Uh, I mean, one cautionary thing, the, uh, the average person listening to this might say, oh my God, he suddenly wants me to go from being a lawyer to being a, an economist uh, or a social worker. And the answer to that is no, but you can expand your horizons. You know, I think if you're doing real estate law, um, you're not going to say, look, I'm only interested in stamp duty and measuring properties and so on. I'm going to focus on the broader markets for real estate and what makes them work 
And I think that's what we need to do as human rights lawyers. Well, I couldn't agree more. Um, and again, thank you, Donna, for the opportunity to uh, join the conversation with Philip and ask some questions. And I think there's some other people who are waiting in the queue. Thank you. Thank so you, Ali. Much very nice to see you. Nice to see you. So I also have um, Mary Cosgrove. I, I discovered uh, yesterday. Mary actually is a lecturer in UIG and contributed to the edited collection. So. Um, Mary was co-author of chapter seven on embedding human rights in tax policy spillover assessments and has a question for you today as well, Philip. Thank you. Can you hear us okay? Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah, <laughs> okay, perfect. No rush. Um, a couple of other uh, questions. I see Stuart as well, you have your hand up. If you just put your question in the Q&A just in case we don't have time to get to, to you, that'd be great. Okay. Go ahead if you can hear us, Mary. You're still muted, Mary. Unmute yourself there. Yeah. Sure, we can come back to you. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, phew. Sorry, my system plays up a little. Uh, thank you very uh, much, Donna and Professor Alston. It's lovely to hear from you and to see you again. Um, I'd like to feed in just a little bit on what you were saying about civil society and the need to kind of cross expand what we know and at the conference which led to that book four years ago you very much put on a, out a strong call for the human rights lawyers in the room to look at tax and vice versa and I think a good bit has been done a lot from the NGO side in getting to grips with tax so as you mentioned Christian Aid and some of the other NGOs here in Ireland were critical in getting the Committee on the Rights of the Child to put on a tax question and the committee was open to it, which is brilliant. I've seen a, so I have seen some positive movement from the human rights side into tax, less so on the other side. And I know developments in international law take time, but I'm getting a little bit despondent on that. And I'm wondering, have you seen any signs uh, that could give optimism that even at governmental level or the international uh, level that the tax, the institutions that deal with tax are in any way listening to this new language and engaging with this extra work that's been done on the human rights side? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I take your point. Um, and it certainly isn't the tax experts, uh, the tax law experts who are suddenly changing their um, views on these things. But uh, I mean, certainly in this country, if I look at all the Maybe it's only the Frenchmen who are doing it, but uh, people like Thomas Piketty, Emmanuel Saez, uh, Gabriel Zuckman, uh, who are all academics, but they are making a very big impact, I think. Um, similarly, uh, people like Joseph Stiglitz, uh, they're all talking very much about the need to fundamentally reform tax systems. They may not, in fact, they don't refer explicitly to human rights foundations, but I think they have, they share the same agenda, basically. Uh, they're calling for a, a recalibration of approaches to taxation. Uh, and I guess, I, I mean, this is highly elite stuff. I acknowledge that, but there's a, a very good international tax program at my law school, NYU, uh, and I see the papers that are being presented here on a regular basis. And you've got some really very sophisticated tax lawyers who are exploring much more progressive ways. Um, I mean, I, I'm not optimistic that um, the Biden presidency will yield a lot, uh, but I'm hoping that the more progressive left, the uh, AOCs, as we call her, the, uh, the Sanders, the Warrens and others will keep pushing uh, the deeper reform agenda because clearly that's what's needed. I would jump in as well. I suppose on the side of optimism, Stacey Abrams started her legal career as a tax lawyer. So <laughs> we're, we're on tax Twitter, at least we're claiming her as one of ours. So hopefully she can also <laughs> right. help. Yeah, well, an admirable uh, ally. 
Lisa, uh, the other thing I suppose that's worrying me a little is the whatever progress has been made and at the UN level they set up the FACTI panel, there's greater efforts to try and link the sustainable uh, development goals and tax and the financing for them. Um, I'm very concerned that the COVID crisis is going to wipe that out completely and that the little progress that has been made by the Global South in getting their voices heard may be lost again. Um, perhaps you might have some thoughts on that. I, I'm, uh, I'm very pessimistic on that. Uh, I think that the SDG process has effectively been separated from financing for development. Uh, the SDGs say very little about reduction of inequality. It's all premised on uh, massive growth rates based on fossil fuel uh, um, approaches. Um, financing for development is um, in something of a stalemate. Uh, there's no progress on an international tax body. Uh, the OECD is pussyfooting around uh, as usual. Um, and I think this is one of the real Achilles heels of the whole SDG thing. Uh, so, you know, it's one thing to have the most progressive possible agenda, but if nothing is being done to change the fiscal structures, which is what this book is all about, uh, then SDGs are not going to, uh, to flourish. And I think that's what we're seeing. It's the same. I mean, the, I did a report on the SDGs uh, recently, and I forget the figure now, but the wonderful estimate that um, UNDP came up with is that uh, women's economic equality will be achieved pretty soon. I think it's 170 years uh, at the present rate. So just hang in there, Mary. We're almost there. Great. <laughs> thank you so much, Mary. Um, we're coming close. To okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just read out some of the questions, Philip, and there's no need to answer them, but if anything jumps out, feel free to. Um, so Mia asks, is part of the problem that taxes are generally shrouded in secrecy? Would more transparency push different thinking on how tax policy is structured? Um, Sean asks, who or what are the, the top three obstacles to achieving what you aspire to in terms of inequality and how can we get movement to change these obstacles or blockers? According to, to Francis asks, um, what are Professor Austin's view, views on Six Capital's reporting, financial, manufactured, intellectual, human, social and natural, is a system which can work and should be adopted by companies? Um, a positive one. Also, which countries currently provide the best balance in terms of tax and human rights? Um, Pamel asks, as a new German, I grew up acquainted with a strong and robust social welfare state, which finds itself in rapid demise with so-called Agenda 2010 and unfair tax policies introduced by a so-called left government. How would you see the future of social welfare states in the face of rising austerity measures at a global scale? And then finally, from Stuart, um, is there really cause to be worried post-COVID? I'm old enough to remember Thatcher's hard money fixation. 85% of the UK's COVID debt has been bought by the Bank of England. The UK is the first country in the world to directly monetarily finance COVID spending, and I doubt that it will be the last. 30% of the UK's public debt is now held by the Bank of England without any significant inflationary effect. If anything, we're staving off deflation. Uh, Stuart is a tax lawyer. Um, so uh, I, I won't ask you to answer all of those questions at this point. Um, Philip, but um, maybe that's food for thought for another day and I'd love to come back together at some point to have this discussion again with you. Um, but sincere thanks. Um, you're such an influential thinker and a prolific scholar as well as a principled and highly effective practitioner and the book touches on really important issues relating to economic inequality, social justice, tax policy and human rights. Um, I couldn't be more timely so I'd like to express my sincere and utmost gratitude to you for sharing your your valuable um, time with us. Um, I know that you're a very busy person and um, we're very grateful to you for working tirelessly towards the creation of a more just and equal world. So is there anything you'd like to um, to bring in that we didn't touch on maybe before we finish up or have we covered <laughs> most of the issues? Um, I think just that uh, the, 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 I know it's uh, very simplistic, but 
the answer to a lot of questions that were posed is that until we take social rights seriously, none of this is going to happen. Uh, because then you always have the broader debate, countervailing concerns and other policy considerations and so on. But I, I, <clears throat> I've said this to my students, um, if I were to reach out and hit one of my students, there would be immediate outrage, not because the student had been hit, but because I had violated my responsibilities and the dignity of the student and the rights of the student were just being brushed aside. We have to get to the stage where when we see people who are homeless, when we see mothers who are scrounging for food for their children, when we see people being turned away at hospitals or getting COVID and not being able to get even basic treatment, we've got to have the same sort of outrage We've got to be able to say, but that shouldn't happen in a society like ours. We can afford better. And until that then becomes a commitment of political parties, a fundamental commitment of human rights groups, and then is eventually ideally put into legislation, all of the other things are going to be uh, able to be presented as countervailing considerations of equal weight but they are not just, you know, you couldn't say, I'm sorry, that student shouldn't have those protections from being hit. We can't afford them. Let's say that some students can be hit. No, that's not on, but it's exactly the same with the deprivation of these fundamental social protections. They must be elevated in the political uh, commitment and then in the legal commitment. I totally agree with you. Thank you so much for being Thanks, so forthright with all of these important um, ideas and insights. So we're very grateful again um, and hopefully see you again in time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.